Hello, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Klein. I'm the inventor of tumescent local anesthesia. Today I'm going to talk to you about tumescent pharmacokinetics and some of the issues of toxicity of lidocaine in relation to tumescent local anesthesia and infiltration local anesthesia. First of all, I'll review some of the recent research we've done in defining the maximum safe dosages of tumescent local anesthesia with lidocaine. We had an IRB approved research project that involved 14 volunteer subjects and we gave them various dosages of tumescent lidocaine uh, subcutaneously in various parts of the body uh, and measured their lidocaine levels over time. So, each patient uh, had three pharmacokinetic procedures. There was a total of uh, 41 pharmacokinetic procedures done, and we measured the sequential serum lidocaine levels with high pressure liquid chromatography, HPLC. The first two, for each patient, the first two uh, procedures involved tumescent infiltration with lidocaine, but no liposuction. And we would use uh, perhaps the maximum we used was 45 milligrams per kilogram without liposuction and the smallest dosage was 22 milligrams per kilogram without liposuction and we chose this range so that we could do some linear regression analysis and the wider the range of dosages the more accurate this linear regression analysis would be. Uh, and finally after the first two infiltration uh, procedures we did a final one that involved tumescent infiltration, usually at uh, 35 to 45 milligrams per kilogram, and did liposuction. And we measured the blood levels after each of these procedures sequentially over 24 hours. So we would do the infiltration and then take serum samples every hour up until, or uh, every other hour up until 18 hours after infiltration. And then we skipped the last six hours and did one final serum sample at 24 hours. So in total each procedure involved 11 serum samples. So we had pretty tight control and we could detect the peak with a high degree of accuracy. So for each of these procedures we determined what the area under the curve would be of the lidocaine concentration time profile and also specifically determined the maximum dosage of uh, serum lidocaine, maximum concentration of serum lidocaine, I should say. And then uh, compared uh, the dosage with the peak levels and were able to show that uh, with some sophisticated tolerance interval analysis that the estimated safe maximum dosage of tumescent lidocaine without liposuction is 28 milligrams per kilogram and the maximum safe dosage of tumescent lidocaine with liposuction is more like 45 milligrams per kilogram. That's because liposuction removes about 28% of the lidocaine before it's absorbed, so we can use higher dosages with liposuction. But there are many procedures now being done around the world using tumescent lidocaine local anesthesia without liposuction. So it's important, and it was important, to uh, define what a maximum safe dosage would be without liposuction. Uh, until now, mo almost all of the pharmacological data that's been published had to do with liposuction patients, but clearly the data from liposuction patients would not apply to patients who have not had li or not having liposuction. So um, we were able to show that there is a fairly close uh, linear relationship with uh, the dosage, milligram per kilogram dosage, and the peak serum concentrations. So that's a nice linear relationship. And then we were able to compare the concentrations, the peak concentrations, and the area under the curve of these procedures, and compare the with and without liposuction. And there's a highly significant difference between the peak levels and the areas under the curve of the lidocaine concentrations over time between liposuction and non-liposuction patients. So that confirmed the, the notion that we cannot use liposuction data to predict the concentrations in patients who are not having liposuction. 
And finally, we uh, use a, a sophisticated statistical program or pro, uh, analysis that used tolerance interval analysis, and this allowed us to, for an individual patient, uh, given a milligram per kilogram dosage, we could predict the likelihood that uh, this dosage would exceed a certain threshold, a predetermined threshold. And for this, we chose six micrograms per ml as the serum concentration for lidocaine that would uh, be the threshold for clinical toxicity. And we showed that uh, the risk of toxicity at 28 milligrams per kilogram without liposuction is less than one in a million. At 45 milligrams per kilogram with liposuction, the risk is approximately one in 200. And <clears throat> at 55 milligrams per kilogram with liposuction, the, the risk is approximately one in 100 to one in 200. But without liposuction at 55 milligrams per kilogram, the risk is about one in seven. So that's pretty uh, uh, worrisome. So we don't use uh, 55 milligrams per kilogram as a dosage. This is a common dosage used for liposuction, but we don't recommend it because if for some reason the liposuction had to be canceled, then the patient would have a, a significant risk of a, at least a mild form of lidocaine toxicity. So that's the pharmacokinetic basis for tumescent local anesthesia and its safety. Uh, I would like to talk to you a little bit now about the actual, actually what we know about clinical lidocaine toxicity when uh, dealing with infiltration subcutaneous uh, local anesthesia. Historically, lidocaine uh, serum levels were not followed uh, or studied after infiltration local anesthesia, but they were followed in the 60s and early 70s in the coronary care unit after uh, patients were diagnosed with a myocardial infarction and given lidocaine to suppress supraventricular tachycardia and, and ventricular tachycardia. Um, th these, th these dosages that were used in the, in the coronary care unit, they found that uh, patients would start to exhibit mild systemic toxicity, both in symptoms and in signs, uh, at about six micrograms per ml of serum. So six micrograms per ml was the threshold beyond which uh, physicians in the coronary care unit would, would turn down the, li the lidocaine drip and make sure that they didn't get any more uh, lidocaine. As a rule of thumb, physicians then uh, decided that uh, they would use five micrograms per ml as, the, as their threshold for stopping the lidocaine dosage. But they, they recognized that six micrograms per ml was the threshold where light toxicity would occur. So even now there's some controversy and the, the clarity of which is the proper threshold isn't uh, universally recognized. But historically, five micrograms per ml was the threshold where coronary care unit doctors would stop the lidocaine and six micrograms per ml was the threshold where they would begin to see toxicity occurring. Um, now the actual threshold for lidocaine toxicity at six micrograms per ml is also a rather fuzzy threshold because it, it's very difficult to define exactly when the average patient will experience toxicity. Certainly it's not a bright red line. There is a normal distribution of patients who, who could have some toxicity at five or or fewer mics per ml, and some we will tolerate much more. But some of the factors that, involve, that are involved in determining uh, lidocaine toxicity involve the rates of absorption of the lidocaine. So if something is given by subcutaneous infiltration using tumescent local anesthesia, the rate of absorption is very slow and very safe as a consequence. Uh, if the, if uh, lidocaine is used for uh, a nerve block, uh, epidural block, the systemic absorption can be very rapid, in which case the toxicity uh, level will actually be a lower threshold. Patients can exhibit clinical toxicity 
uh, after rapid systemic absorption at a lower level. So five mics per ml might be a, a level of toxicity uh, for a patient after rapid absorption, whereas with slow absorption, the level of toxicity doesn't occur until six mics or more per ml. That's an important distinction. <clears throat> it means that there is no magic bright red line level of toxicity. <clears throat> In addition, not only is the rate of absorption an important factor, but the rate of metabolism is an important factor. So if a patient is taking uh, drugs that block lidocaine uh, enzymes, lidocaine, the res enzymes responsible for lidocaine metabolism, the, the cytochrome P450, 3A4, and 1A2, if those are blocked by drugs, there's a drug interaction that will uh, slow the lidocaine metabolism down to the point where uh, a given dosage, milligram per kilogram dosage of lidocaine, will give a uh, higher risk of toxicity. So the rate of absorption is important, the rate of metabolism is important, and there's other things to consider, for example, protein binding, etc., that might or might not have a, an effect in a given situation. But these are the concerns. Um, overall, we want to uh, understand the toxicity so that uh, we can avoid it. Now, clinically, what we see <clears throat> is that almost all of our patients getting large volumes of tumescent local anesthesia for liposuction and in the range of up to 45 milligrams per kilogram, uh, and many of them less than that, but the, almost all of these patients will experience drowsiness without any evidence of toxicity. And when we check their blood levels, their blood levels are 2 mics per ml or 3 mics per ml, but not above that. And virtually everyone is drowsy. So I do not consider drowsiness as a toxic uh, symptom. Um, there is a, a certain percentage of patients who are susceptible to nausea and vomiting from lidocaine. It is uh, Usually the, the thinner patients will experience this at a given dosage sooner than a, a more obese patient. And that's because the peripheral fat stores act as a reservoir for lidocaine. So patients who are given a, uh, a given dosage of lidocaine, tumescent lidocaine, if they're thin, their blood levels tend to be a little higher than if they're uh, obese or, or, or just a little more fat on, on their periphery. Uh, so these... Uh, cases of, of nausea and vomiting also uh, can occur at, at relatively low serum concentrations. For example, when I've had the opportunity to check on patients who've uh, had some nausea and vomiting, their, thresh, their levels at the time were on the order of 2.5 uh, or and certainly less than 3 mics per ml. So I don't consider that as a, as a serious risk for uh, impending toxicity. On the other hand, there are some commonly recognized uh, symptoms. Patients will feel jittery, uh, perioral numbness, uh, and so that is a, a, perhaps an impending form of toxicity. Certainly diplopia, ataxia as signs of toxicity uh, are, are to be a, a concern. So those are usually seen early in the onset of a lidocaine or local anesthetic toxicity. Now there's three stages of local anesthetic toxicity that are recognized. The first stage is uh, relatively uh, low serum concentrations up, up to the threshold of toxicity, up to and including the threshold of toxicity. And these are the mild symptoms and, and signs that I've discussed. Uh, beyond that, lidocaine will start to manifest uh, neurologic signs, so an impending seizure-like activity uh, can occur, uh, and this is a, a warning that something serious is going on and that the immediate uh, resuscitative measures need to be ready and in place uh, and beyond the, that level, which usually occurs, I'm uh, told, uh, between eight and 10 uh, mics per ml of serum concentration. Uh, beyond that, one can start to see uh, cardiac depression, hypotension, and, and cardiac failure. 
So uh, that's when uh, things can get really serious. Uh, with bupivacaine, uh, there is no premonitory onset of neurologic symptoms. So for bupivacaine, which is a more cardiotoxic drug, it can go from mild symptoms right into cardiac failure, and there's not much uh, warning that this is going to occur, so it's a bit more dangerous. That's why one of the reasons why we prefer to use lidocaine. I should add that uh, in my clinical experience, over nearly 30 years of doing tubescent local anesthesia and carefully monitoring our patients, uh, we have had only one case of very mild lidocaine toxicity, and that was due to a patient who had taken Zoloft, uh, a drug that inhibits lidocaine metabolism. So, uh, in general, tumescent lidocaine is extremely safe in clinical use. There have been a number of uh, surveys done in the United States and in Germany in which they looked at uh, deaths associated with liposuction or serious complications associated with liposuction. And these were large surveys, including uh, hundreds to thousands of, of surgeons who do liposuction. And they found uh, deaths due to pulmonary emboli, uh, to infection, etc. But there were no reported deaths associated with lidocaine toxicity and no reported complications associated with lidocaine toxicity. So worldwide experience and the careful pharmacokinetic data show that tumescent lidocaine is a very safe if used correctly and, uh, and pitfalls are avoided. Now the pitfalls are the ones that I worry about because this is uh, the pro a problem. If a surgeon takes a, uh, or an anesthesiologist or a clinician takes a, a safe technique and doesn't follow the rules and gives too much drug or uh, doesn't use it in the right way, there can be problems. So it's important that uh, you follow a series of safety tips for tumescent lidocaine anesthesia. I've presented another series of lectures on uh, safety tips for tumescent lidocaine anesthesia, and I hope you will have a chance to look at those, uh, save you some grief. It's, uh, uh, it's just a warning that this technique is safe if used correctly, and, uh, there, but there can be problems if uh, it's not used correctly. So uh, I'll conclude with those remarks, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. You can look at uh, tumescent.org for further information and more details. Thanks. If you should like some more academic information about tumescent lidocaine anesthesia, go to tumescent.org. If you'd like information about the surgical devices and tumescent infiltration equipment, go to hksurgical.com. Thanks.